Mark Newman. Uh, Dr. Newman is the MFO Rappaport Distinguished University Professor of Physics and Professor of Physics as well as Professor of Complex Systems. And uh, Dr. Newman is PhD in Physics from the Department of Theoretical Physics at the University of Oxford in 1991. He was a postdoc at Cornell and Santa Fe Institute. Since 2002, he's at University of Michigan. And he, he's known for the fundamental contributions to the field of complex networks and complex systems, for which he was awarded the 2014 Lagrange Prize. And Dr. Newman's uh, network based methods have been applied to a variety of fields sociology, economics, biology, psychology, and most importantly, I also fascinated with one paper. Uh, the structure and function of complex networks that received the most citation in any mathematics paper between 2003 and 2011. I just checked today, 13,500 citations. And so I just want to say personally, I'm so inspired by your work, Dr. Neiman. And, and please welcome to Dr. Neiman to our department again. Very good. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about networks today. I'm going to tell you about some work that we've been doing in my group, me and uh, a large uh, cast of co-conspirators. Um, so I'm not a, a biologist. I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm a physicist who does work Mainly what I do is developing methods to try and understand network data. But the kind of techniques that we develop have been uh, widely applied in many branches of biology. So I hope that some of the things I'll tell you about today will pique your interest. Um, when I talk about network, uh, I just mean a bunch of dots joined together by lines. In the jargon, uh, dots are called nodes. The line, the line is planted. So nodes and edges, uh, we're interested in networks because uh, they can be used as uh, representation of the structure of many different systems of interest to us as scientists. Uh, this picture here, for instance, is a picture of a protein interaction network. So the nodes in this network are proteins, and the edges represent physical interactions between proteins, which ones form complexes, which which other ones. So of course, there's a vast amount of literature on the study of the individual nodes in this network, i.e. individual proteins, their structures, how they work, what they do, um, and of the individual edges in this network, i.e. complexes, which protein interacts with which other protein. Um, but what we're interested in is the bigger picture. Uh, what can you learn by looking at the network uh, on the larger scale, not just the local scale of let's look at this one node or this one connection. Let's look at the larger network. Just to give you a, a sort of little just so story of why this is a worthwhile thing to do, um, the, the World Wide Web is an example of a network system. It's a network where the nodes are web pages and the edges are the hyperlinks between them. You click on this web page, it takes you to that other web page. Uh, those of you who are old timers like me will remember when the web first came out. Uh, if you remember back to 20 years or so ago, if you tried doing a web search back then, we had search engines like Lycos and AltaVista and Hotbot. Remember any of these? They were terrible. They really did not work well, right? They, you type something in, and if you're lucky, you might get a page that was vaguely related to what you were looking for. It was a real art to find anything using these. And then, in 1996, Google came along, and it was a revelation. Suddenly, it worked really well. Why did it work well? Well, the trick that Google found was that you should be looking at the connection. You should be looking at the structure of the network, not just at the individual web pages. Earlier web engines had looked at What's on the pages? Look at the text. 
oh, you're looking for a web page about network theory. Okay, we'll look for pages where the words somewhere contain the words network theory on the page, right? Okay, that's a good start. What Google realized is that there's useful information in the links between the web pages as well. Very roughly speaking, what Google does is it looks for web pages that lots of people link to. Now, uh, lots of people link to this web page. Oh, they must think this is an important web page. We'll bump that one up the rankings. And this turns out to be a very effective means of identifying which are the important web pages. So they realized that there was information not just in the nodes of the network, but in the links linking together in the structure of the network. And if you consider money to be a good indication of success in this business, then they've done very well out of that, become billionaires by exploiting the structure of that particular network. Um, here's some other examples of networks. Uh, this one uh, is an epidemiological network, uh, a network that's uh, involved in the spread of disease. So diseases spread from person to person. The people are the nodes in this network. And the edges connecting together, in this case, are who's been in close physical proximity with who. Meaning, you know, close enough to sneeze on someone or close enough to cough on someone. That's how diseases get transmitted. And you give someone the flu, you sneeze on someone. So the flu travels over a network like this of close physical proximity between people. And if you want to know how diseases spread, predict how they're going to spread, or find some way to prevent them from spreading, then you need to know the structure of this network. Um, networks appear not just in biological fields, elsewhere as well. Here's a technological example. This is a picture of the internet. Uh, so the internet is uh, a network where the nodes are computers and the edges are data connections between computers. And you can certainly well imagine that the structure of the internet, the structure of this network, affects how data gets from point to point. Uh, that a well-designed internet would get data around efficiently and between computers and a poorly designed one would not. And you could ask questions like, how could we improve the structure of this network to make it do its job better? Are there any bottlenecks? Are there any weak points? So you can certainly imagine there could be a connection between the structure and the function of this system, the internet. Uh, here's, here's one more example from my own work. This is a social network. It's a network of collaborations between scientists. The nodes in this network are scientists. And the edges are who's written a paper with whom. So this is sort of somehow communicating the structure of science, who's working with whom, and the groups that people work together in. And, uh, so again, you would certainly, you could certainly believe that uh, the structure of this network is connected with uh, different schools of thought in a particular field. You could find a group of people working on one thing over here and a group of people working on something else over here. We believe that the structure of the network is correlated with the properties of this. Now, th these examples that I just showed you are, are all actually kind of unusual in one respect, which is that I can make nice pictures of all of them. They're all rather small, rather sparse networks where I can draw a picture on a piece of paper or on the screen here, and you can roughly speaking what, see what's going on with this network. This is actually rather rare. Uh, most networks that we look at are quite dense, and they have quite a lot of nodes, and you try and make a picture of them, you get something that looks like this. Just some giant hairball. Uh, very difficult to make out what's going on. Uh, in the data if your data looks like this. Mark Vidal at Dana-Farber likes to call pictures like this ridiculograms, which I think is as good a name as any. Uh, apparently, the official definition of a ridiculogram is that it should be visually stunning, scientifically worthless, and published in Science or Nature. Um, <laughs> uh, I did not say that. Um, Here's some other examples. This is a picture. So that, that one, incidentally, was a, a protein interaction network again. This is, uh, this is a metabolic network, product of substrate metabolites in the cell and the reactions that turn one into another. This is a portion of the World Wide Web. I think you'll agree that it's pretty impossible to tell anything about the actual structure of the network by looking at a picture like this. This is another protein interaction network. I find it hard to believe that anybody even bothered to publish this picture. You know, what are you supposed to learn? by looking at a picture like this. So this is part of the problem that we're dealing with. We have these very large data sets. They're very dense. You can't really look at them. You can't see what the structure of this network is. So you know, eyeball analysis doesn't work in these cases. 
So one of the things we want to do is understand what the structure of these networks is, even when you can't make a picture of it. And that means we need to have some more rigorous, some more formal way of analyzing and extracting structure from them by doing something in computation. Um, so, uh, so one good question here is when I ask what do I when I ask I want to understand the structure of a network, what do I really mean by that? What is structure in a network? And there are various ways you could define structure. Maybe structure is the thing that makes a network not random. It's lack of randomness in the network. Or maybe structure is some property of the network that's correlated with the particular thing that you yourself are interested in. Um, but the, I think probably the best definition of structure, as I'll be talking about it in networks, is that it's something which allows me to give you a simple description of what's going on in the network. Right? In general, if you have, give me a big complicated network like this one, I want to describe the whole thing, then you know, it could be millions of nodes and millions of edges, and I have to tell you where every edge is. I have to give you a lot of information to describe the structure of the network. But it's also possible that I could give you just a very simple small piece of information and it would still be very useful to you. Like I could tell you that this network is divided into two big clumps of nodes, one here and one here, right? And that could tell you something very useful about the structure of this network, and yet it's just a single sentence. So structure is, uh, for me, some simple thing that I can extract about this network, something that I can tell you about the network um, that doesn't require me to give you millions of pieces of information. Because human beings, frankly, are not useful. It, that's not useful for human beings. They're not good at understanding millions of pieces of information. If I give you a terabyte of data, it may accurately describe the structure of this network, but you as a human being can't really interpret it. You need to somehow boil it down into something simple that's actually descriptive and useful to us as human beings, and that's what we call structure. Um, so let me give you uh, a simple sort of illustrative example of that. Um, this is a fake example. It's, it's like an idealized example. It's not real, but it shows you the kind of thing that I'm thinking of. I'm going to make a fake network, and it's going to have this particular kind of structure in it called community structure, which is uh, where the network divides up into a bunch of different clumps. This is only one kind of structure, and I'll talk of many different kinds of structure today. But this is one of the ones I'll talk about. Um, there, are, there are many other things that we will consider today, such as core periphery structure, dense cores surrounded by sparse periphery, ranking structure, where the nodes of the network are aligned in some hierarchy, uh, latent space structure, where the nodes are arrayed in some space, which is usually unseen. It exists, but we don't observe it, and we need to infer it by looking at the data. Um, hierarch hierarchical structure where a network breaks up into parts and the parts break up into smaller parts and so forth. There are many different kinds of structure these networks can have and I'll talk about several of these today. But for this first example, let me uh, talk about community structure which is the breaking up of the network into these parts. So this is something that might very well be interesting in say a social network. There's a clump of people here who will interact and another clump of people here who will interact. Okay, that's interesting. What is it that defines these two clumps? Why are they not interacting with each other? It might also be interesting in a uh, metabolic network. Oh, there's a clump of metabolites over here that all interact with each other. Or it might be interesting on the World Wide Web. Oh, there's a clump of web pages here that all link to each other. Right. So people are interested just in being able to pull out this kind of structure from networks. And there's actually a big industry that's evolved of people coming up with smart ways to do this particular. But that's not what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to give you a very simple example where I'm going to make a fake network that has this kind of structure. In it. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to use something called a stochastic lock model, which is a simple mathematical model of a network. It works by taking some number of nodes and dividing them into groups. Say I divide them into three groups somehow, anyhow I like. And then I'm going to throw down edges at random between those nodes with probabilities that I choose. There are going to be two different probabilities, one that I'll call P in is the probability that there's an edge between two nodes that are in the same group. The probability that I know somebody who's in my own circle of friends. And P out is the probability that I know somebody in one of the other circles. The probability of an edge between two nodes that are in different groups. Just two probabilities. And if I choose P in to be large and P out to be small, then I have traditional community structure. I have dense connections within the group and only a few connections between the groups, like the picture I've drawn here. 
That's what we call community structure. It's clump of nodes over here, clump of nodes over here, but not very many connections. So suppose that was my structure. Now I'm going to try and detect that structure in the network. So this is a trick that we quite often do in this area. We make up some fake network where we know what the structure is, and then we ask, can we actually detect that structure in the network? Good way of checking whether your methods are working. And uh, so here's one way of doing this. I'm going to take this network, I'm going to represent it as a matrix. So I can, if I've got n nodes in my network, I can draw an n by n matrix, and I put ones in it to represent where the edges are. So if there's a, give, give the nodes numbers from one to n. If there's an edge between node 13 and node 20, then I put a one in the 13 comma 20 element. So just an n by n matrix with ones to represent the edges and zeros everywhere else. It's called the adjacency matrix. So now I'm going to calculate the spectrum, the eigenvalues of that, of that matrix, and they look like this. So this is an actual example. I fed the adjacency matrix into the standard QR algorithm, and it gives me the spectrum of that matrix. Uh, and you see an interesting pattern. You have almost all the eigenvalues in a sort of band here on the left, and then you have a small number of outlying eigenvalues that are separated from all the others over there on the right. That's what you see in this numerical calculation. This was an actual network that I did, but we can also prove using methods of random matrix theory that this is exactly what you're expecting in this particular case. We can do the whole calculation because the model is such a simple thing. So here's the thing. It turns out that this gives you a very nice decomposition of the structure of the network. There are n minus three eigenvalues over here in the band, and it turns out that they are random isotropic vectors. Those eigenvectors just point randomly in any direction. In other words, there is absolutely nothing there. On the other hand, over here, these outliers are definitely not random. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. That's where all the structure is. So this model network that I made up has structure in it, namely that the nodes are divided into these three groups. And there's more connections within groups than there are between groups. That's the structure. But there's also randomness, which is just that the edges themselves I just threw down at random. Right? So there's both structure and randomness in this network. And this spectrum neatly divides the two things. This stuff on the left is purely isotropic random. There is nothing there, just random vectors. This stuff on the right is where all the structure lies. First of all, you can show that the number of outlying eigenvalues there is equal to the number of communities in the network. So I can just look at this picture, and I can immediately say, one, two, three, oh, I know I have three groups in this network. I can just read it straight off by looking at the spectrum. But more than that, if I take, so ignore the leading eigenvector, I take the other outliers, not the leading one, so these two in this particular case, there's two eigenvectors there. They're all n element eigenvectors. This is an n element in an n node network. So I've got two n element vectors. I'm going to put them together to make a two by n matrix, a very tall thin matrix, and then regard the n rows of that matrix as coordinates. So each row has two elements. I'm going to regard those as coordinates in a two-dimensional space and plot the n dots that they represent in the two-dimensional space. And if I do that, I get this picture here. So this is, again, the exact same net network. It's a real network. I actually did the calculation. And what you see is three very nice clumps of dots. And if you uh, work out which node each of those dots correspond to, you find that the three clumps are precisely those three communities that you had in the network. So in other words, those leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors tell you how many communities you have, and they tell you exactly who's in which community. Everything else here on the left is just random rubbish. So the spectrum very nicely separates the structure in the network from all the random stuff. So this is the kind of thing we'd like to do. Effectively, when I say I want to make a simple statement about the network to you, these three eigenvectors over here are my simple statement. They contain all the information about structure, and everything else seems sort of filtered out. That's the kind of thing that I want to be able to do. Um, so we've spent quite a lot of time working with these spectral methods. Here are just a few examples, figures from things we work on. This one over here is a social, an animal social network. It's a network of uh, friendships between dolphins. Dolphins make friends, apparently. 
this one here is a host parasite interaction network, it's a parasitic interaction network. But so a bunch of these different things. It, th these methods are useful for extracting this kind of structure from the network. However, they're not precise, they're not what I'm mainly going to talk about today. Um, I'm actually mainly going to talk about inference methods today. And the reason is that these spectral methods, although they're sort of elegant in some ways, they're really only good for this trick of community detection. There are many other kinds of structure that we'd like to be able to detect, and they're not flexible in the way that they can be adapted to many other kinds of structure as well. So I'm going to actually be talking about a more general class, a class of inference methods based on ideas of statistical inference. I realize that there are some people in this room who are world experts on statistical inference, but I don't want to assume that everybody here is an expert in statistical inference. So, uh, so before I get into talking about the actual calculations we've done, let I'm going to do a little sort of primer here on what I mean by statistical inference. I'm going to do it not using network ideas. I'm just going to do it just for ordinary regular data, the kind of data we already have, we measure in the lab, whatever. So here's my example of statistical inference, just to sort of set the stage. Um, suppose I measure some bunch of numbers. I just measure some numbers in the lab or something like that. I measure n numbers. I'll call them x sub i, where i runs from 1 to n. And suppose, so those numbers are represented by these little green lines at the bottom of my plot here. Um, and suppose that I know these numbers to be drawn from a normal distribution. I don't know which normal distribution it is. Right? The normal distribution has two parameters, the mean and standard deviation. But assume that I don't know those things. All I know is it's drawn from some normal distribution. The question is, given the data that I observe, can I work out what the mean and the standard deviation of the normal distribution from which they were drawn? The answer is, of course, I can. Otherwise, I wouldn't be asking the question. Uh, and how can I do it? I can do it by uh, a conventional maximum likelihood method. So uh, the way this works is uh, I write down, first of all, I write down the normal distribution. There it is. The top line there is just the regular normal distribution for mean mu and a standard deviation. So it's just a Gaussian, even minus x squared type thing. So that says that's the probability of making a measurement x. Uh, given the mean mu and the standard deviation. So now I ask, well, what's the probability that I made all of the measurements, the n measurements that I made in my experiment? Well, assuming they're independent, that's just the product of the probabilities for all of them. So there's the probability of measurement x sub i, take product over i equals 1 to n, and then just take this expression for p of x, put it in there, and I get this expression here for the total probability, which can be simplified over the course of this experiment. So that's what we call the likelihood of the data. It's the probability that I measured a particular set of data I did. At this point, I still don't know the mean mu and the standard deviation sigma. They're just represented as arbitrary symbols in this expression, but I don't know what the values of those things are. However, this probability of measuring the data certainly depends on the values of those symbols. For instance, if I measured a bunch of measurements here and my Gaussian is over here, then those measurements look very unlikely. They're very unlikely to have been generated from a Gaussian over here if I measure them all over there, right? Much more likely, my Gaussian was over here where my data are. Uh, so not all Gaussians are equally likely given the data that I observe. So this expression here measures the probability of the data that I observe. So what I'm going to do is maximize that probability. I'm going to ask which values of mu and sigma are most likely to have generated. I'm just going to maximize this likelihood here. Uh, actually, typically, one maximizes the log likelihood, which is the log of that quantity. Um, you know, log is a monotone function, so maximizing the log is exactly the same as the monotone function itself. It just turns out to be technically easier. So I'm going to take the logarithm of this thing here, and it gives you that expression. So I'm going to maximize this with respect to mu and sigma. So here, here's that expression again. I maximize this with respect to mu, for instance. Mu only appears over here. Differentiate that with respect to mu, set the result equal to zero, I get that expression there, then rearrange that for mu, and I get that mu is equal to the sum of my measurements divided by the number of measurements n there, which is, of course, the standard expression for the mean that they teach you in middle school. Uh, but when they teach you this in middle school, they don't teach you why that is the correct expression. They just expect you to take it on faith. But you don't have to take it on faith. 
right? There is actually a derivation for that exper expression, and here it is. This is how you derive that expression. That's where that expression comes from. You can do the same thing for the standard deviation, differentiate, set it equal to zero, and you get this expression for the standard deviation, which is also the standard one. That's where it comes from. So what you're doing is you're taking a model, in this case the model is a very simple thing, it's just a Gaussian, and you're fitting it to a set of observed data by maximum likelihood. In other words, you're writing down the probability that you got the data you observed if that model is correct, and then you're maximizing that probability with respect to the parameters of the model. So now we're gonna do the exact same thing, but we're gonna do it with networks. So it's gonna be a bit more complicated. The model is now going to be a network model. In other words, a model that generates networks. And the observed data are going to be a network. And we're gonna calculate the probability that the observed data, i.e. the observed network, were generated by that model, and then maximize that probability subject to the parameters of the model. So it's exactly the same procedure, just with more complicated data and more complicated models. So let's see where that gets us. So the first example I'm going to give is the one we already looked at, detecting communities in networks. So I had some networks, and I believe that uh, there's some clump of some communities in this network. And the model that I'm going to use to do the detecting, the model that I'm going to fit is one that I've already described. It's the stochastic block model, where I throw down some number of nodes, and I throw edge down edges between them at random. I'm going to generalize it a little bit. Instead of just having two probabilities, p in and p out, I'm now going to have probabilities for every pair of communities. So there's going to be a probability, which I've noted omega 1, 1 here, for connections between nodes in group 1 and another node in group 1. And omega 1, 3 is for connection between the node in group 1 and node in group 3. So there's going to be a whole matrix of probabilities for the edges. Now. Those are parameters of my model. And the other parameters of my model are who belongs to which group. Right? I also have to say which node is in which group in order to fully define uh, the particular special case of this model that I'm looking at. Now, I'm actually not really interested in these omega parameters that govern the probabilities. It's the who belongs to which group is the thing I'm really interested in, because that's going to tell me how the network breaks down into communities. Uh, I use omega here instead of p, because I'm using a, a slightly different model. It's a Poisson model instead of a Bernoulli model, for those of you who care. But it's basically the same thing. I can write down an expression which gives the probability of the observed graph or network G, given the parameters, that's the omegas and the Gs, and it's given by this expression here. And then what I want to do is just maximize that with respect to the parameters. There's two sets of parameters. There's the probability of omega, and there's the who belongs to which group. So G sub I here is which group node I belongs to. So if there's three groups, then G sub I could be one, two, or three depending on which group you belong to. So g is a discrete variable. And maximizing things over discrete variables is hard. Omega is a continuous variable. It's a probability. And maximizing things over continuous variables is easy. So let's do the easy bit first. We maximize this over omega just by differentiating. And uh, we do some work. And blah, 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 blah. Uh, we get an expression like, that looks like this. So after maximizing with respect to omega, my log likelihood has the following form. It's a sum over R and S, our group. So if there are three groups, then R goes one, two, three, and S goes one, two, three. So it's the sum over all pairs of groups. M sub R S is the number of edges that go between group R and group S. And N sub R and N sub S are the number of nodes in group R and group S. So the way you need to think about this is, you give me a candidate division of the network into groups, then that defines how big the groups are, that's n sub r, and it defines how many edges run between every pair of groups and within groups. So I can calculate all of the numbers here and plug them into this expression, and I'll get an expression for the log length. Now I want to further maximize that with respect to who belongs to which group. So I can calculate the value of this quantity for any candidate division of the network that you tell me about. Now I want to calculate it for all candidate divisions and find the one that gets the highest score. And that will be the maximum likelihood fit uh, of this model for this network. The catch, as I said, is that 
discrete optimization is difficult, and optimizing of discrete degrees of freedom now, that's something we have to do just numerically. I can't do that by differential. So the final stage of this process is that it gets run complete numerical optimization. Um, but in the end, it works quite well. So here's just one example. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. So this example is, um, this is a famous example from the social network literature. This is a small social network of students at uh, a university, a US university. They're students in a club at a university, so it's from a study done in the 1970s. Um, uh, so it, it was actually a karate club at this university, a place where students go to practice their karate. Why do we care about this? Well, it's a famous study because it just happened that while this guy was studying this particular group of friends at this university, a dispute arose in the club. They had a big argument about something or other, and it split into two. And the claim is that if you look at the structure of the network of who was friends with whom, that's what we're looking at here, you can work out how the split was going to happen. So this network was measured by the, you know, he just fortuitously happened to come in a year before the split happened and measure the structure of the network. So we know what it looked like before. Now the claim is that you can work out how it was going to split by looking at the structure of the network. So you take this network and feed it in the algorithm I just described to you, and it splits it according to the colors that you see there, the red and the blue. Um, and it turns out that that split is almost exactly along the lines of what did happen in real life, even though this network was measured a year before the split happened. So if you had known what you were looking at, you could have predicted a year beforehand how this community could come out. Here's another sort of fun example. This is a network that I got from uh, my Michigan colleague, Lada Adamick, um, she did a study of political blogs. So these are websites on which people express their opinions about politics. Um, and uh, so the nodes are websites, and the edges of the network websites are which, no, which websites link to which other ones on the web. So there's some link on this website, you can click on it and take it to the website. So she did a big study of this, and she gave us the data, and we fed that into uh, our algorithm, and it splits the network up into two clear communities, which I've, been, which I've labeled blue and red in this picture. Uh, and, and it turns out that those two clear communities correspond very closely to the political alignment of the website. So these are all blogs about politics, some of them are liberal, some of them are conservative, and it turns out that even if you didn't know about liberal and conservative politics, you could tell which blogs were which just by looking at the structure of the network. It splits into two very clear communities. The liberal ones cite other liberal ones, and the conservative ones cite other conservative ones, but there are very few connections in between. And this algorithm, that's exactly what it's detecting. It's looking for those clumps of Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that is a good question. In this particular case, yes, we are. More generally, you don't always have to do that, but it's a difficult job, actually, working out how many clumps you have. So often what we do is we just try the analysis for a lot of the different kinds of clumps and then look at what we've got. And, you know, if we learn something from one of those analyses, then that's great, we learned something. But, uh, but you're not necessarily do, saying this is the best fit for this number of clumps. And as I say, that turns out to be, it's not entirely a solved problem, how you should do it. So sort of the model selection problem is another good one. Um, okay, so, so that gives you an idea of the kind of thing we're doing. What I want to do in the remainder of the time is give you uh, a, a series of examples of other applications of these kinds of ideas for various networks. I'm going to start off with some examples which are really just very slight variants on what we saw already here. But then as uh, we get towards the end of the hour, I'll sort of go further afield and we'll look at some more examples. So, uh, so here's one example which is really just a slight variant on what we've seen before, but an important one, I think. Almost everything you'll see in this literature on networks makes the assumption that the data we have are correct. But of course that's not true. These are experimental data, and very few experimental data are completely correct. So uh, in other words, usually if you, they claim that there's an edge there, you just assume that there is an edge there. But 
that's not really right. When people say there's an edge there, what they mean is, well, we're kind of 90% sure there's an edge there, and maybe 10%. That might not be an edge. So what we really have are probabilities. We don't just have yes or no um, for each edge in the network. We have some probabilities that exist. Um, so let's suppose that instead of just an adjacency matrix that's completely composed of zeros and ones, we have an adjacency matrix that's composed of probabilities that say probability that we believe an edge is there based on the experiment that we've done. So I'll call that matrix Q sub ij. That's the probability that nodes i and j are connected by an edge. So in the conventional interpretation, these probabilities would all be zero or one. Zero meaning there definitely is an edge there, one meaning there definitely is an edge there, but in reality, of course, that's not true. So probabilities are often sort of in the gray area in between zero and one. So one way to handle data like this, and the most common thing that people have done up to now, is they just place a threshold on those probabilities. Like they'll say, anything above 50%, I'll call that an edge. Anything below 50%, I'll call that an edge. However, this is obviously not a very good thing to do. There's a huge amount of difference between an edge which is there with 1% probability and an edge which is there with 49% probability, but those are both less than 50%, right? So they'd both be considered non-edges, right? If you tell me I have a 1% chance of winning the lottery, I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound great, but if you tell me I have a 49% chance, I'm like, oh, I quite like those odds, right? There's a big difference there, right? So you're throwing away a lot of information if you just sort of threshold it. So it'd be much better if we can actually make use of everything that's contained in these probabilities. Um, so we did some work on this. This is work I did with my student, Travis Martin, who's sitting in the audience over there. Um, uh, so what we do is we say, what we'd really like to do is write down a likelihood function for the probability of the data we have, that's this matrix Q, given the parameters of the model, that's who belongs to what group and the, the probability is only the same thing as before. And we break that down as the probability of the actual true graph, the true network, you know, really which proteins interact with each other or whatever it is, which we don't know because that's not what we measure. So that's the probability P of the graph given the parameters of the model. We don't know this. It's not measured in the experiment, but we know the functional form because that's precisely the thing that comes out of the stochastic clock model. That's the same formula that we already have. Multiplied by the probability of the data given the unobserved graph G and then summed over all graph. This part here, probability of Q given G, we don't know. But magically it turns out we don't need to know it because it turns out actually it just cancels out when we do the calculation. We only need to know this part so we can still do the whole maximum likelihood thing. And when we do that, we can make sort of optimal inference and community structure in networks where we only have this sort of fuzzy data. We're not really sure of the answers we have error bound. Okay, so just as an example, here's one thing that we did. So this is some tests of the kind that I was talking about before where, uh, where we make up some data, some fake data where we know what the structure is in the network and then we see if we can retrieve that. And we compared what happens if you use our algorithm, which is that dotted blue line there. So the, this vertical axis here is me measuring how successful we were at recovering the structure. It's a measure of what fraction of the nodes we place in the correct group. But it's basically just higher is better. So that blue line is how well our method did. This red line is how well you do if you just threshold the data like I said before and then just apply conventional techniques to the network, you get that threshold. There's, of course, various different choices for where you could place the threshold and you do better or worse depending on where that is. That's what this curve is showing. But never does it come anywhere close to how well you do if you actually do this properly and allow for the errors. Um, okay, so that's really just a slight variation on something we already saw. Here's something a little bit further afield. We're still looking for groups in networks now, but now we're going to acknowledge the fact that those groups might be a bit fuzzy. So previously we said, well, let's look for ways in which this network breaks up, but everybody has to belong to one group. It's like a hard division into the guys in this group and the guys in that group and the guys in that group. That's often not what happens in real groups. If you think about a social network, for instance, you belong to a bunch of different groups. You belong to your family and you belong to the people you went to college with and people who you work with at your job and so forth. So 
the groups are overlapping. And in fact, you're the person in the overlap. You're belonging to several different groups. So this is a common thing that happens in lots, lots of networks, that a node can play a role in this group, and it can play a role in that group as well. So we like to allow for that to happen. So the way we do that is something similar to what we do before, but I'm going to introduce an extra set of parameters here, I'll call them theta sub ir, uh, that uh, theta sub ir is the fraction of the edges connected to node i that connect it to group r. So I'm in a particular group, and some of my edges connect me to this other gr this group, and some of my edges connect me to this other group. So this is sort of measuring how strongly I'm connected to various different groups. So this is sort of a generalization of the G parameters we had before, which is for everybody in one group or another group. Now I can be in some mixture of these groups. So I can write down uh, a log likelihood for this model as well. There it is right at the top. And in principle, at this point, I can now just maximize it the way I've done with everything else. Just differentiate is equal to zero. I'm actually going to do something slightly different in this case, something a little more flexible. Um, so I'm going to say, suppose I knew what the parameters theta and omega were in this model. If I did, then I can calculate this quantity over here. Q sub ij is a probability. It's the probability that nodes i and j belong to groups r and s, respectively. That's what that thing is joint probability, and it has a very nice, simple expression in terms of the parameters that I know about. Well, if I know this quantity here, using that, I can write down expressions for the parameters. They're also quite simple. They're given by these expressions here. So if I know Q as a function of the parameters, and I know the parameters as a function of Q, then I can just solve for everything. What I do, basically, is uh, I guess the values of the parameters, feed them into this equation here, get Q, Take Q, feed it into these equations up at the top, and get the parameters, and I just keep on going back and forth between those two until the whole thing is fixed. This is called an expectation maximization algorithm. It's a new technique in Bayesian inference. And uh, it has a number of advantages, but one of its advantages is that it's fast. Um, it's really just these three equations. You have a five line program, you just go around this loop over and over again until this thing converges. Um, and that, that allows this method to scale up to very large networks. This is definitely one of our goals here. Some of the networks we're looking at have millions of nodes. We'd like to still be able to analyze those. Um, so one could, in principle, just directly maximize the log likelihood in this case. But this method here is more powerful in a number of ways. Here's an example application to a social network. Um, so what you're seeing here is the colors represent who got put in which of several groups in this network. What you see is that most nodes get put in one group, but there are some nodes that got split up between several different groups, as represented by the little pie charts there. And actually, an interesting thing happens. Um, if you look at the nodes that get split between several groups, you'll notice that often they're the nodes with a large number of connections. There are some nodes that have got a lot of connections, and those nodes typically are the ones that just don't sit comfortably in any group. You know, if you're connected to lots and lots of people all over the place, then you don't really belong to just one group. You belong to many different groups. So it's natural to split those up between several different groups. <coughs> These nodes that are very highly connected uh, give you problems in cases where you're trying to split the network up into completely non-overlapping groups. Allowing the groups to overlap solves that problem. The, ones in, the nodes in the overlap are often the ones that have very large numbers. And by putting them in the overlap, you can allow them to connect to several different groups at once. One can get rid of them. So this is uh, really only a slight variation of what we saw before. Almost all nodes are still in only one group. But the problem nodes, you can now deal with them by putting them in different groups and get a better fit to the model than you could before. Um, OK, uh, a little bit further afield still. Uh, so far, I've just been thinking about dividing networks up into groups, you know, such that there are a lot of connections within groups and a few connections between groups. But there are much more general ways you could divide up or classify the nodes in the network. Um, it doesn't just have to be, I'm in a group and I have lots of connections in my own group. There could be many other things you could do. For instance, the definition of being in this group here could be that a person in this group here has lots of connections to this other group over here and a few connections to this group down here, and not very many connections to this group, and some connections to the rest of the group. 
or whatever. You know, I can think of some complicated thing, but this pattern of connection is what defines being in this group, right? The definition of being in a group doesn't just have to be, I have lots of connections in my own group. There are many other ways groups could, could be defined. So I can talk about more general classifications. Can I just classify the nodes of the network up into some pattern? But what I want to do is I want to do that without saying what pattern I'm looking for. I don't want to say I'm looking for traditional community structure where everybody's connected in their own group. I want to say, just find me any pattern that gives a good description of this network. So we can do that as well. We can write down a model where you have sort of general probabilities for a vertex in a group are to be connected to other vertices anywhere else in the network. Um, you can write down the likelihood for that. You can take its logarithm, get a log likelihood. You can write down an EM algorithm. Again, it's fairly simple. It's just three equations. Which you can iterate around a small loop in your computer program pretty quickly. And what it allows you to do is take networks and uh, divide them up into groups, but in very general ways where you don't have to specify how you want to do the division beforehand. So it could be traditional community structure where people connect to their own groups, but it could be other things as well. And whatever it is, the program will find that and work it out for itself. So here's an example. This is, a net, this is a lexical network, in fact, I, a language network. In this network, the nodes represent words. Uh, they're actually the 100 most common words that appear in the book David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, which I chose just because it was a childhood favorite of mine and because it's available freely online. Uh, and the edges in the network represent which n words appear next to which other words. So adjacency of the word. These are nouns and adjectives in this particular example. So I got rid of all the conjunctions and adverbs, pronouns, and so forth. Um, and in the English language, uh, usually what you get is an adjective next to a noun. An adjective comes before a noun, like uh, the red bus. Okay. Sometimes you get an adjective before another adjective, like the big red bus. Sometimes you get a noun before another noun, like the big school bus. That can happen, but most often it's adjective next to noun. Right? So that means that most of the connections in this network should be between an adjective and a noun. In other words, between nodes of unlike kind. Not between, not within group, but between group connections. There are only rather few within group connections. So you take this network and you feed it into the algorithm I just described. And lo and behold, it's split it up into two groups of nodes, and they correspond very closely to the nouns on the left and the adjectives on the right. So the nouns are in the black dots here, and the adjectives are the white dots here. So it's pretty clearly found the nouns and the adjectives in this network. It doesn't know anything about language, but it's worked out what's a noun and what's an adjective. But moreover, the structure it's found is not conventional community structure where most of the connections are within the group. They're not. Most of the connections are not between noun and noun, or between adjective and adjective. Between noun and adjective. You can see that in this picture. Most of the edges run between the two groups, very few of the edges run between the two groups. Okay. So I didn't have to tell it this. It just found the particular kind of structure that makes sense for this. Here's a more extreme example. This is just an artificial example we made up to test the method. Um, so this is a network in which there are four groups of nodes plus these eight keystone nodes in the middle. This was sort of motivated by ideas that come from ecology and food web. There are eight keystone nodes in the middle, and we threw down a bunch of edges here. Almost all the edges in this network are completely random. So they mean nothing at all. They're just there to try and throw the algorithm off its game. But what defines the structure is that every node is connected to two of these keystone nodes, and which ones it's connected to define which group it's in. So there's lots and lots of connections there which mean nothing at all, but if you look carefully, each node has two connections which tell you which group it's in. But we didn't tell the algorithm this. We didn't tell them that it's keystone nodes or that this is the definition of groups. We just feed this into the algorithm and magically it comes up with the right answer. It's rearranged the nodes into the four groups. The colors here represent the four groups it was supposed to find and you know, it hasn't got it perfectly right pretty good, and uh, and it also separately picked out the eight nodes in the middle. 
the middle of or the region of a measure of gravity. So in theory, quite complicated forms of classification structure network could be picked out using this method. And moreover, you don't need to know in advance what you're, you're looking for. You just say, find me something that describes what's going on. Um, okay, in the last few minutes, let me give you a few other examples. I mentioned core periphery structure. This is a different kind of structure where there's sort of a dense core in the network and a sparser periphery around the outside. You can do that too using a stochastic block model again. It's just a block model in which you have two groups, the core and the periphery, and there's lots of connections in the, in the core group, and there's very few connections in the periphery group and the sort of middling number between the two. But it's still a stochastic block model, and the same kind of inference method still works for that as well. Here's just an application that was used to pick out the core nodes in the interim. Um, hierarchy, I mentioned, is sort of a generalization of community structure where you split a network up into groups and then you split those groups into smaller groups and those into smaller groups and so forth. We can do that as well. The way we do that is we represent the hierarchy by a tree-like structure that represents how the nodes split up and how those split up and how those split up all the way down until you split the thing into the single nodes at the bottom of the tree structure there. Then this tree structure is your model and that's what you're picking. So you can use this, you can fit it to a network, and you can derive a tree structure from it. Actually, looking at the tree structure is not very helpful. It's just the raw output of the algorithm. It's not terribly useful. Often it's better to just look at the network itself and see how it breaks up into groups, like this one up here on the top left, and then how that group breaks up into smaller groups of the and so forth. So we're dividing and subdividing the network. This particular example here is uh, it's an ecological network. So food web. Um, I will skip over this stuff, but uh, I want to finish on time. Uh, latent space structure. Latent space structure is, uh, suppose I have some network that's somehow embedded in a space. Every node in the network exists somewhere in the space, but I don't know where. I just know that it's embedded in the space somehow, and that the positions of the nodes affect the probability that they'll be connected. So an example would be, uh, uh, a road network. So this is a picture of the interstate network of the United States. The nodes are intersections between interstates and the edges are the road network. Right? So if two nodes are close together in this map, they're more likely to be connected by a road. They're very far apart. Um, so now suppose you're given only the network itself, but you're not given where the positions are. The question is, can I infer the position? nodes just by looking at the structure of the network. So the positions of the nodes are now playing the role that was previously played by who belongs to which community or who belongs to which group in the network. It's the unobserved defining variable that's really telling you what the structure of the network is. So uh, yes, the answer is absolutely you can. You can write down, again, a model for this, and you can write down a likelihood for it, and you can maximize it. Um, here's an example of that. This is the neural network of Key Elegans, famously derived by White et al. in the 1980s. And uh, each of the nodes in this network is somewhere in the body of the Key Elegans. And what we did is we took the neural network and we fed it through this algorithm and said, what are the positions of the nodes? What's your best estimate of the spatial positions of the nodes? And that's what the colors represent here. And what you can see is, that the colors sort of nicely go through the spectrum from red to blue to green to yellow at that end. It's not perfect. Again, there's some red nodes here. There's a few sort of greenish ones in here. But basically, it's, it's got them in the right order. It's, got, it's worked out that these nodes here are at one end and then sort of going down the body of the world. Here. So if we were only given the network, we could estimate roughly how the neural network is laid out physically in the body of the world, just knowing what the uh, a sort of nice special example of this is uh, ranking or status in networks. Um, here's some results from a project that I did with my former student, Brian Ball. Um, here we were looking at social networks. These are social networks that come from uh, schools. So a large study, not a study we did, a study done by some other people of friendship networks amongst uh, 
her skin to the US issue. One of the interesting things about the data that come from these studies is that uh, there's a directionality to it. When you go into schools and you want to work out who's friends with whom, you ask people, you circulate questionnaires, or you do interviews and say, who are you friends with? And what you find often is that person A says they're friends with person B, but person B doesn't say they're friends with person A. This is quite a common occurrence. About 50% of the time, this happens. Now, historically, the sociologists said, okay, that's weird. There's obviously something wrong with our data. But perhaps there's not anything wrong with the data. Perhaps that pattern is actually telling you something. When person A says they're friends with person B and person B doesn't say they're friends back, maybe there's something going on. So that was the hypothesis. The hypothesis was that there is a ranking, a latent face structure that we're not observing, that the kids in the school are somehow arrayed along a dimension. Some kids are sort of higher up the hierarchy and some are lower down the hierarchy. And when you say you're friends with someone, you tend to say you're friends with the kids that are cooler than you are. I mean, I know this from my personal experience. Um, and the, the kids that are cooler than you are do not say that they're friends with you. Okay, so that's the hypothesis, right? So we can check that. Again, what we do is we come up with a model where there's a latent space variable that says where you are in the pecking order in the school. And there's a probability that one person says they're friends with another person based on your relative position in the pecking order. Okay, so you write down the, the model. I won't go through it in detail, but I'll show you some of the results. So what these two plots show are the probability that a person will say they're friends with someone else based on sort of their difference in rank, their difference in where they are in status. And there's an interesting thing that happens. The left-hand plot is for pairs of kids where they both said they were friends with the other kid. Right? In that case, there's this huge spike at zero which says that almost all pairs of friends who said they were both friends, they're almost at exactly the same height in the hierarchy. Apparently, the kids in the schools have a very clear idea of exactly where they come in the pecking order, and they're friends with other people who are at exactly the same level, right? So in almost all cases, two kids say they're friends with each other, then they're, they're at exactly the same level in the hierarchy, high or low, but exactly the same level, so the delta is very close to zero. But if you look at the one-way ones, where one kid says they're friends and the other one doesn't, now it's this lopsided distribution. There's still a big spike at zero, but there's also this sort of long tail that goes off to the left there of people saying that they're friends with kids who are cool than they are. But also notice the way it sort of drops off. Basically, it's kids saying that they're friends with people who are just a little bit cooler than they are, right? They don't say they're friends with like the coolest kid in the class because nobody would believe them. But they, they you know, they, they, they say they're friends with this person who's just like a little bit cooler, cooler than they are. So, so that was the hypothesis. We, we tested this by looking to see whether these inferred latent space positions, these rankings of the kids in these schools, are correlated with other things that are widely accepted to be measures of status among uh, school students. Um, so for instance, this one over here shows in degree. In degree is just how many people said they were friends with you. In other words, the total overall popularity, which is widely assumed to be a measure of status. And you find that there's a strong positive correlation there of the ranks that we infer with overall popularity. Another one is age. It's, it's widely accepted among sociologists that the older kids in schools have higher status than the younger kids. And indeed, you find that the average sort of ranking of the kids increases as you go through the grades. We did this kind of analysis for 84 different schools. We have a huge data set that we got from these people at Duke University of uh, networks in 84 different US schools. And this pattern holds extremely well across all of the schools that we looked at. It's very strong. Um, I see that I'm out of time here, so I have to stop talking. Um, before I do, I just want to say thank you to my terrific collaborators on this. So a bunch of students who worked on this with me. Travis is the only one who's still here. He's sitting over there. Um, and uh, the others have moved on to other uh, things. Uh, one postdoc, Tiago, and uh, two faculty collaborators, Raj Rao, who's here in the uh, uh, School of College of Engineering here at U of M, and Chris Moore, who's here. Um, thanks to them. Thanks to you for listening. Okay, that's it. I'm done.
so, so the networks are the data. You mean there's more than one different model that could? Yes. Um, okay, so you're saying like if I have one particular model, say the stochastic block model, there's more than one maximum likelihood, right? Well, so yes, so that's absolutely true that there are. So, so this is this is an excellent question, and there's several different aspects to this. So one is there are some networks where uh, there are several different maxima, and they look nothing like each other. There are several different ways of breaking up the network. There are a few good examples that people have come up with where there are competing ways of breaking up the network, and they're both meaningful, or several different meaningful ones. They just are breaking up along different lines. Something like that I've, you know, I've got a social network and it's breaking up along lines of age, but it's also breaking up along lines of gender or lines of ethnicity or something like that. There could be more than one meaningful division. But in most cases, when there's the divisions are really completely different, it, what it's usually telling you is just that the signal in the network is not very strong. That it just isn't really a very strong division. If there's a really strong division there, then pretty much you sort of gravitate towards it. The algorithm is not going to have any difficulty finding it. And you can get roughly the same results every time. So if you're getting totally different results every time, it probably means there isn't very strong structure there, and then you're not really interested in the first place. Uh, you also get stuff like what you're talking about, where I get slightly different divisions of the network. I run the algorithm several different times, and I get slightly different results. And uh, I think what that's telling you is just there's some fuzziness in the answer. And you can get at that by, well, just running the algorithm many times. But a better way of doing it is these EM algorithms, which I didn't think too much to go into in the detail. But they give you a full posterior distribution of all possible assignments of nodes to hidden variables, groups, or latent states, rather than just a single maximum likelihood assignment. So that then you can actually, by the width of the likelihood peak, you can work out the error on your assignments and so forth. And you can do complete statistics on the assignments and you can say not only what is the maximum likelihood assignment, but how much we expect variance to be. So those kind of things for certain show up in all of these cases. And yeah, if, if your peak was very broad, then you wouldn't be able to trust the results very much if it's very narrow. Could you comment about using multivariate time series to elucidate mechanism, elucidate networks? Um, OK, so that's also an excellent question. So most of these networks vary over time, for sure. Um, and relatively little has been done on that. Uh, we, in my group, have actually just started thinking about that with my other student, Tommy Shang, who's back there, um, has been working on some ideas to, to do with this. Um, so we're hoping to find something exactly along the lines of what you're suggesting, which is that I can, uh, by combining data on how these things vary over time, I can get a better handle on the structural variables that describe the structure of the network than I can by looking at any one snapshot. In a sense, um, the data, when you're looking at networks, are networks. A network is a data point. It's not a data set. When we're fixing, when we're, when, we're, when we're fitting data to this model, what we really have is one measurement of our system. Right? We have one internet. Right? We don't have lots of internet. The model generates an ensemble of possible different internet, but what we measured is only one. So in a sense, it's a difficult inference problem if you really only have one measurement. But if you have many over time evolving in some way, then in principle, you should be able to do better. The simplest approaches to this have been just to assume that if you have several measurements in the network, they're independent. But almost certainly they're not. Most of the ones we're looking at, they're very highly correlated. And that's basically the feature that we're trying to incorporate in the work that we're doing. But as I say, it's early days yet. This is not something a lot of people have done. Thanks for the talk. That was really cool. Uh, my question is, what are, I guess, what are advantages of this method in, in terms of, you know, uh, accuracy and computational complexity over, for example, uh, markup processes or some modern algorithms like uh, t-distributed stochastic uh, neighbor embedding that allow you 
you know, take those big, large data sets and embed, embed them in the smaller uh -huh. subspaces and do this kind of clustering, separation between clusters and uh -huh. meaningful visualizations as well. Well, so those kinds of methods are useful, for sure. Um, uh, a lot of the kind of calculations that I've been talking about here could be done by Monte Carlo methods. We don't actually do them that way because we think that we have more computationally efficient ways of doing them. Most of the stuff that we're doing is doing quite simple from leaf propagation, which basically does the same thing that Monte Carlo does for you. It does the expectation step of the EM algorithm, um, but it does it a lot faster. Um, but in principle, one could absolutely use Monte Carlo to estimate the cost areas on these models. It, it would work just fine, just slightly slower. Um, uh, other models like uh, various hidden variable models, you can do that, but see what they're doing is they're assuming a particular structure of the model. They're assuming, for instance, say that nodes that are closer together in a latent space are more likely to be connected. We don't make that assumption. They may be more likely to be connected, but we're not assuming that. All we're, all we're doing is we're asking the algorithm to come up with some description, come up with some assignment of nodes in this latent space, plus something else, that allows you to give a compact description of the network. That something else might be that nodes close together are more likely to be connected, but it might be that nodes over here are likely to be connected with nodes over here, and these nodes are unlikely to be connected, or anything. It can be any sort of combination of probabilities depending on latent space variables. So, uh, so if you knew in advance what sort of patterns you were looking for in your data, those kind of methods would work and indeed might be faster than what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're looking for, then these methods are very flexible. You just feed your network in and you say, give me a good description of these data. And it turns out to work very well. Thank you, sir. Well, I thank you for the talk. Is there some kind of uh, infrastructure like software or things, uh, modules within some kind of standard framework where uh, folks that are new to this could plug and play and start to try out some of this stuff? There are. So uh, there's a large amount of uh, software now available. One of the nice things, so this field has you know, been going in earnest for 20 years or so, and in the early days you had to write your own programs, but in the last 10 years, especially in the last five years, some people who are real experts on the computational side of this produce some very nice software packages. You know, my software that I use um, uh, is, is, you know, me hacking up something in an afternoon. It's not elegant. Right. But there are people who know what they're doing on the computer science side who've done some very nice stuff. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, two packages that I use a lot that I really recommend. One is called Gethi, G-E-T-H-I, which is a, uh, you know, pull-down menus type thing where it's very, nice visual interface and you don't need to program at all. It just has a lot of the standard algorithms built in to run them. Another one is something called Network X, which is a Python library. So it's for people who are programmers. You write your own Python program, but then the network algorithms is just called a library subroutine that does all your hard work for you. And uh, although I do write uh, my own software to do some of the calculations these days, I use those packages a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, um, uh, this is a great um, speech you have. I open up a mind, which is a big question is about the network, especially the term structure by itself. The Silicon Valley, which has become the epicenter of the digital revolution, was long believed is network. But after that, people don't believe that. It is the cluster of creativity. That gentleman mentioned about cluster. What is a cluster? To me, it's mess. The real world is mess. So the, the, the set up this aid kind of network is the way open the door to see the map. So my question I actually ask you that is holistically, do you have some kind of algorithm or idea to see how we can link some ideal structure, this and this, for example, uh, the, uh, the latent space and the hierarchies and tree star, but something in between is actually we can discover something. 
rather than set of program and equations. So the cluster is the analysis, what I think more important than the network. Uh, any comments? Thank you. Um, so, so if I understand you're asking, fine, I can look at a network and decide how it breaks up or something, but can I understand something about the real system that it's describing in terms of those results? Um, so, so absolutely you're right. In a sense, this is all just the first stage of the analysis. If you are actually, if you have a data set and you actually want to understand what's going on, these kinds of methods would, what they would give you is a simple description of your data. They say it breaks up in this way or it's embedded nicely in this space or it has this kind of hierarchical structure to it. Um, once you've discovered that, that's really only the first step. Now you have to ask, what do I understand in biological terms or in physical terms, or in social terms, that this is telling me? So I'm going to have to do some additional analysis where I say, go look at the groups that I found in the network and say, what is it that characterizes them? Why is it that this bunch of people are all talking to each other and this bunch of people are all talking to each other, but they're not talking to each other? Right? That's not something that you're going to get out of the network itself. That's something that you, using some scientific insight and some understanding of the system, are going to have to work out. So this me these methods will sort of tell you where you should be looking, but they'll not tell you what you're going to find. So absolutely, there's this is the first step, and then uh, there's many more steps to come after this. Done this kind of thing. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.